I'm on the fly or in the end, as you prefer, as I cannot see the chat. So I will go back to any chat questions uh, after uh, the presentation, I guess. And uh, then uh, let's start with our today's topic, uh, which is uh, suspiciously similar to my previous topic of the presentation, which was undefined behavior. However, it was not uh, planned, uh, just uh, things connect in a mysterious way. The topic for today uh, are several impressions about uh, code portability of C++. Uh, with uh, C mostly, and uh, ABI uh, compatibility topic. Uh, agenda is, uh, well, uh, mostly explaining uh, why these topics are bigger than uh, most of you might have uh, thought, uh, because uh, normally you just uh, live your life and develop your code without thinking uh, much of it unless uh, you dig deep into project uh, details or need to port some things or even worse uh, adapt some uh, legacy solution into your code and then weird things happen and you start to investigate and it turns out that ABI compatibility, for example, is a really big and hot topic in the C++ community all the time. And also I will tell a bit about architectural differences in C++, which are much more complex than it was taught in the university, at least in my old times and uh, some compiler differences and also why there are any compiler differences if each compiler is supposed to do more or less the same thing. And uh, yeah, there is also a hidden agenda, which is a takeaway message uh, why environments uh, are maybe a bit more complex because there are some extra aspects of uh, complexity you might uh, not be fully aware of what needs to be kept in the back of your head when you modernize some code base, and generally what can go wrong when you use a precompiled shared library, like in the case when you just buy one version of some closed source library and want to happily proceed with some code modernizations either on your side or you get a new version of this library and you just happily plug it into your build system and what can go wrong in such case. The inspiration to this tech talk is a situation we had in our project several months ago when we needed to take a closer look at several of these uh, topics. And uh, as always, some suspicions I had about uh, C++ standard were absolutely wrong. So I prepared this presentation so that you don't have to go the same path uh, I needed to take uh, some time ago. And uh, yeah, before we start, Let's uh, maybe think about uh, these two questions, which was uh, what uh, past me uh, assumed at least at some point of my career. First question, is it okay to just uh, show some C code into C++, wrap it in extern C and uh, then uh, sleep safely because uh, come on, it's uh, wrapped in extern C, so it will work all, all the time. A second question, uh, is uh, static cast uh, always uh, safe? Uh, because, uh, well, it's uh, in a C++ standard, so it's okay. And third question is, uh, is it safe to always assume in some calculations or transformations that no matter the architecture, uh, character type uh, is uh, always uh, unassigned because it doesn't make sense for it to be signed, right? You may think about these uh, three questions. Uh, there will be some answers or hints. Uh, what are the answers uh, to these questions uh, in the presentation? So you may compare uh, your answers uh, before and uh, after. 
also you may also become suspicious about these things and uh, it's a correct it's a correct uh, guess in uh, all these cases and uh, yeah here is uh, the exact uh, function uh, which uh, made uh, my assumptions about uh, point uh, one uh, wrong because uh, we were using some C code and there was this function. It's uh, not uh, exactly its signature because I simplified it not to use some project specific uh, values. Anyway, there was a function, it was a C function, which took several arguments. First of them was handle to some object. Second and third types were booleans. And uh, first and the last type was uh, just uh, some pointer to some uh, array of structures it was, I think but it uh, didn't compile, even if we wrapped it into an extern C block. And uh, you may take a closer look and think about uh, what could go wrong in this case. I will just take a sip of water. I cannot see the chat, but uh, these people who guessed that it's about uh, second uh, argument uh, whose name uh, is uh, perfectly legit for C, but uh, which is a reserved keyword in uh, C++ being wrong, uh, was uh, correct. Fun fact is that uh, in this exact uh, project, there was also some callback named uh, delete, what was also perfectly legit for C, but it was a reserved keyword for C++. And uh, obviously it was uh, not allowed uh, at all to use such construction. It's a really corner case situation, but it uh, needs, to, needs to be kept in mind uh, when using some C code in uh, C++. We'll get back to what externcy exactly does uh, in a moment as well. Now let's talk shortly about uh, C++ code uh, portability issues uh, in uh, some larger details than just a uh, single word size. And uh, yeah, a short reminder, there are several compilation stages. Uh, it begins with preprocessing, uh, which produces expanded uh, source code. Uh, then it's an actual compilation producing assembly code, which is later used to produce uh, object code. And then uh, linker takes all object code files to produce the final executable or uh, binary. Uh, why do I bring it up? Uh, the fact that something uh, just compiles correctly in the second step doesn't mean it will link properly because a linker can uh, take uh, compilation results or assembly results and just say, okay, but I don't have a correct expansion for this and that uh, method or this variable definition is missing for me. And uh, also the fact that something uh, links properly with some shared library especially doesn't mean that uh, it uh, will start correctly and uh, will don't have any surprises uh, when loading things at uh, startup. And of course, a hidden point here is that even if everything uh, loads properly at startup, it's not a warranty that uh, there will be no uh, runtime crash at some point. Uh, if you use uh, a lot of uh, big applications like Photoshop, uh, most probably you encountered some runtime error at some point. Hopefully you had your work saved by then. And uh, yeah, why do we even bring this uh, topic up? Because there are uh, two entirely different approaches when it comes to compile things. There is the right ones, so run everywhere approach or run anytime by Java, 
where everything is uh, always fixed, uh, all variable sizes are hard coded because uh, applications are run on a special virtual machine which uh, handles uh, all uh, platform related uh, communication so that uh, users uh, never care about uh, pointer size or word size on a particular architecture as uh, everything is uh, more or less the same in every environment. And uh, there is also approach uh, which is used by C and C++, which is the uh, right ones uh, compile everywhere. And uh, this approach uh, is uh, platform specific uh, and uh, you need to be aware of uh, internal size and some architectural details uh, because you rely directly on them. There is no extra middle layer or adapter. And uh, yeah, it's uh, platform specific, platform native, as I said. And uh, why isn't even is it even a thing? Uh, yeah, it's uh, the largest advantage of uh, C++ because uh, you can perform some platform specific uh, optimization, and uh, your execution time is. Uh, much shorter and uh, more efficient, and you are allowed to use uh, full power to squeeze everything of uh, this uh, architecture to do things fast. And it's really great, especially for uh, bare metal environments or some constrained environments, uh, because imagine somebody trying to fit a Java virtual machine on an 8-bit uh, processor. I don't think it's uh, really possible, as well as I don't think uh, it's uh, really useful in uh, such case. So C++, as well as C, use this approach to make uh, their job fast and to do things uh, it's desired to do right. And also, as I said, it's its big biggest uh, advantage. However, it comes with a cost, and uh, that's why we are having this uh, talk because there are architectural differences and uh, usually the most common ones which are usually mentioned are type sizes used uh, registers for some operations especially when multiplying large uh, numbers handling undefined uh, behaviors because uh, as in uh, as I said in my previous tech talk, uh, if behavior uh, is allowed to be undefined, uh, you cannot rely on it in any way. Exception handling. Uh, also, uh, each uh, compiler is allowed to do things in a different way to introduce uh, some special uh, tweaks uh, which uh, other compilers uh, don't uh, do. Anyway, uh, okay, somebody may say at this point, but uh, yeah, there are C++ standards, uh, there are core, core guidelines, and uh, maybe it provides us some help so that we can uh, skip most of these things and just do our thing, uh, but uh, not really. There are two more uh, terms. I need to bring uh, now because uh, there is uh, one definition rule and uh, more or less it means that there be can be only one declaration, one, uh, uh, one, uh, imp uh, okay, I forgot the word, uh, one uh, relevant declaration of something uh, at the time in uh, C++. It means that uh, in uh, some uh, weird uh, cases, uh, if there are two different uh, declarations in two different blocks, uh, we may run into a complicated issue of uh, one overwriting another, if it uh, wasn't detected by the compiler previously, of course. And there is also one uh, technique used by a C++ compiler. In case we have several uh, methods uh, with the same name but different uh, signatures, 
what is perfectly allowed in C++ uh, due to name overloading. And uh, this way, compiler just uh, slightly changes uh, names of these methods, uh, mostly basing on their signatures, so that uh, several functions with the same name but different signatures uh, do not uh, violate uh, one definition uh, rule. And uh, why am I bringing it now? Because, yeah, see how uh, name mangling differs between uh, all the compilers. Here, uh, only good thing, because, yeah, we have uh, several ages. Uh, and the good thing is uh, that uh, the largest compilers, which is GCC, Clang, and uh, Intel C++, uh, mangle them in the same way. But you cannot uh, take it for granted for different compilers. Uh, if you go deeper into this uh, Wikipedia entry, you can even uh, see that some compilers have several different name mongols and juggle between them. So uh, it's the first uh, difference if you take object code uh, of uh, one compiler and do things with it in a different compiler. Uh, you may run into some uh, weird things, definitely. And uh, there is also a topic of uh, extern C, which I already brought up. Uh, and uh, some people, including me in the past, uh, had an assumption that uh, it's a magical adapter of C, co C code uh, to be C++ compliant. But uh, nope, uh, it's only a linkage uh, specification, which means that uh, uh, don't do any name mangling with uh, this part of the code, as it's a C code and it uh, may go wrong. So just use uh, C rules and no C++ specific rules, because this code uh, doesn't uh, contain them uh, anyway. And on top of uh, this uh, keyword as a names uh, issue, there are also some terms which were understood differentially for C and C++. Only example I could uh, invent out of my head was the auto keyword, which, uh, well, meant something entirely different in uh, C and uh, C++ and became obsolete at some point. Uh, so it's also great to check this uh, old uh, pieces of C code for such things if you need to. Anyway, uh, extern uh, C doesn't uh, make uh, C codes uh, magically compilable and uh, cooperative with uh, C++ code. And uh, yeah, there are the core guidelines I mentioned uh, before. And uh, the direct quote from the guidelines is that using valid uh, ISO C++ doesn't guarantee neither portability nor correctness. And there are some very general hints uh, what uh, not to do. And uh, it uh, doesn't exactly say us uh, a lot about uh, how to be portable and uh, safe uh, each time. Both of uh, these uh, mentioned uh, dependencies to avoid are architectural differences. So, uh, yeah, uh, there are no responsibilities to hide uh, developers uh, from these things. And unfortunately, it's a responsibility of a developer to keep that in mind and uh, deal with it when writing code that should be portable. There is also one more uh, difference, uh, which I was uh, honestly not aware of, that it's a standardized term. There are two different kinds of uh, implementation. Uh, it includes some C++ standard uh, libraries and some system headers. Uh, implementation can be hosted and uh, freestanding. Uh, 
I think a good uh, analogy is that uh, hosted things are much uh, more uh, low level things which uh, need uh, to be strongly connected with hosted uh, environment. And the uh, freestanding uh, part is uh, independent from uh, OS uh, or architecture you are using. It's uh, great to always check if uh, standard library headers uh, you are heavily using in your environment are hosted or freestanding because, well, freestanding things are independent from your OS and architecture, so it's uh, pretty safe uh, to use them as much as you want and uh, the hint uh, for environment specific parts uh, was to use well platform specific uh, macros which is uh, very very ugly but uh, works at least uh, any way to decide uh, which piece of code to launch depending on the architecture uh, can help good thing is that uh, it's uh, connected with a clean code so that high level decisions are not motivated by low level details. Then let's see what is not freestanding. And unfortunately, many things are still not fully freestanding or they became freestanding in later standards. These are headers and the bad thing is that Unique pointer is not freestanding. Runtime type information are very architecture specific. And I saw many advices uh, not to assume they are fully portable. And the worst thing is that uh, STL is uh, not freestanding. And uh, uh, there is also one more note that uh, some uh, C++ casts like reinterpret cast uh, doesn't do any type safety validations. Uh, it just uh, well reinterprets the casts and uh, it uh, can in some corner cases uh, perform uh, conversions between uh, unrelated uh, types so that uh, static cast as well as reinterpret cast uh, needs uh, to be used with uh, cautions uh, if you want your code to be portable and uh, some extra testing uh, is advised. Ah, uh, yeah, and array is also not freestanding, unfortunately. So uh, it's bad because uh, there's uh, not many C++ nice things which are fully freestanding still. From what I remember, uh, Google started uh, to write uh, their own uh, pieces of uh, STL at some point, uh, but uh, why they didn't change the original ones, uh, it's a topic uh, we'll talk about uh, in a moment. And the least freestanding thing and the most architecture specific thing, apart from, of course, hardware registers are exceptions. Always accepts exceptions are very specific to the operating system and uh, making any assumptions about, <coughs> sorry, exceptions doing anything from your code's perspective uh, is a risky topic. And, uh, oh no, <coughs> I'm fine. And I remember one piece of code when uh, we were using exceptions. <coughs> oh no. Uh, to make uh, returns from some different modules. And uh, yeah, it's definitely something you shouldn't do. Of course, apart from it being a bad uh, software pattern, it's also absolutely not uh, portable, portable at all. And uh, yeah, let's uh, do some uh, example. We've now switching to God Godbolt uh, because uh, this example is pretty obvious. So. Here you have a really simple function doing one thing and not even printing the result. And you just want to compile it with several different compilers. Should be a no-brainer that it works, but nope. Here's a result uh, I took uh, yesterday. It uh, builds fine on uh, GCC, but for Microsoft Visual Compiler, 
mysteriously algorithm is uh, needed as well. That's why I always say that it's a great thing to use uh, at least uh, two different compilers uh, for your multi-platform code uh, in your testing because you may find out uh, many things uh, similar to this, especially for Microsoft compiler. There is also one more aspect if you really want to introduce a new C++ standard. It doesn't come overnight uh, on all the compilers, meaning that all the features uh, are supported. Here are uh, here's a snippet from uh, core language features from C++20. As you can see, it's not fully introduced everywhere. Some features are introduced partially. Great thing is that for MSVC, C++, uh, GCC and Clang or C++20 features are available. But at the moment you move to some uh, less mainstream compiler, it's a good uh, hint to check if uh, everything is uh, used. Funny fact about uh, this uh, table is uh, that in Intel C++, concepts uh, were supported and uh, then removed. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to check what was the story behind it, but such things just uh, may happen, especially if uh, you are to use some features which are, which are freshly introduced in a new standard. And uh, yeah, go to, let's go to the second uh, big topic of this uh, presentation, which is uh, ABI compatibility. It's maybe not about writing a code which is portable, but code that is uh, durable and uh, won't make your users uh, angry. Here's an example I've already brought before that uh, I think everyone who used some uh, big uh, applications, be it Photoshop, AutoCAD, any music related software, you most probably had a situation that after some upgrade, uh, most of your plugins stopped working and you needed to download them again for the new version. And then after each major application upgrade, it was an issue. Maybe you needed to stop using some of the plugins because they were not compatible anymore. And uh, yeah, most probably it was because of ABI incompat incompatibility of uh, your new software with plugins uh, made for some previous versions. Of course, uh, it makes everyone uh, angry. Sometimes uh, there is uh, no options uh, to make uh, your software, your new version of software compatible with uh, plugins uh, built for its previous version. And uh, yeah, nobody wants to do this to their application's uh, user base, especially if uh, you are doing some closed source things and there is no option for end users to just uh, recompile uh, your program. Yeah, so let's go back to the definition because API is not uh, ABI. API is a programming interface uh, where the scope is source code. Uh, you just define uh, signatures and names of your functions and objects uh, different applications are allowed to use when using, for example, your shared library. ABI is application binary interface. So it's an API, but uh, for your piece of hardware, it uh, is some sort of an agreement uh, between applications and the system on some architecture. How do they communicate? How do they exchange data also with uh, kernel? And uh, its uh, point is uh, to be able to link things uh, dynamically to each other so that they can share information. I saw a really good uh, analogy of ABI to network uh, protocols. However, bad thing is that network protocols have some version numbers, but in case of ABI, you don't have them. And uh, 
it's one of the issues why things are like this. Actually, sometimes you have uh, libraries versioning, but that's all. And uh, if you have just uh, one executable running somewhere with not much dependencies, uh, you don't think uh, much of it because it all just happens under cover and uh, it works. Problems start if uh, you create a shared library or if you need to incorporate uh, your part of application into some larger ecosystem which is constantly modifying itself. And uh, yeah, it's uh, great to have uh, ABI compatible and uh, general rule of thumb is that uh, apps uh, which are able, ABI compatible can function on uh, any system which uh, uses this ABI and you don't need to recompile them. Uh, here are some details uh, what ABI uh, agrees on. It's, uh, uh, you can see many analogies to network protocols because it's ordering, uh, calls convention, types representation, format of object files, uh, loading programs, as well as linking them uh, dynamically. And so everything that C++ standard uh, defines that it just happens, but it's up to ABI to define how it happens. And uh, yeah, it's uh, tied to architecture as well as uh, tool chain in use. Uh, here there are several different ABIs which are all valid for uh, C language and partially C++, but it doesn't mean they are uh, by default compatible with uh, each other. And uh, yeah. Why do I even bring this topic? Because uh, it's uh, easy to break the compatibility. There are some uh, great uh, guidelines uh, what uh, not to do if you don't want to break the compatibility. They are in uh, further reading slides. Uh, generally changing uh, things like calling convention, type of a return value, function signature will break the ABI compatibility and uh, what's not good is that changing almost anything about a function or a class will break ABI. Uh, usually it is safe to introduce uh, new things, but changing anything about uh, objects that uh, already exist uh, can be pretty risky. And uh, I remember uh, there was a great example in one of the calls, which are also linked in a further reading, is uh, that uh, Vtable ha Vtables have uh, entirely different implementation for each uh, compiler. Its uh, only recommendation is, uh, well, to have them and to make them deterministic so that if you have a class with uh, two virtual methods and a virtual destructor, you can never assume that, okay, the first entry in the V table will always be the first uh, declared method and the last one will be a destructor. And uh, yeah, you can see where this is going. It's uh, easy to make such assumptions based on one compiler and then boom, you called uh, destructor twice and uh, bad things happened. And unfortunately, exactly same uh, limit uh, also implies to C++ standard uh, libraries. And uh, if uh, C++ uh, really wants to be ABI uh, compatible by all means necessary, it means that uh, introducing some new things uh, is uh, pretty risky and uh, there were several incidents where guys uh, broke ABI compatibility, which I will tell about in a moment. Okay, so what can happen if ABI compatibility is broken? Well, more or less, uh, we'll get undefined uh, behavior. In a good case, uh, we will just uh, get an error about particular library not loading on startup. 
In a bad case, we will get a runtime error where some uh, function with a mismatched uh, signature is being called, for example. And in a super bad case, what is also corner case possible, yet possible, we'll get runtime undefined behavior when these mismatching functions are called. For example, we'll load the calculation results from a wrong register, which contains some rubbish. And uh, we will only know about it uh, in some uh, long time because uh, our calculations will go absolutely wrong. Here is a super dumb analogy about uh, ABI and uh, it shows uh, why it's uh, important. Uh, if you want to have some short example or takeaway message from this lecture, feel free to use it. Uh, imagine that uh, each uh, application is a Marvel movie with some uh, Marvel heroes who are, in this case, shared libraries. And uh, in such story, if you replace uh, one hero with its version, which is newer, later, or from a different uh, multiverse, team doesn't make sense because it's uh, not uh, balanced. And uh, yeah, it shows uh, more or less uh, what are the problems uh, possible and uh, why your application just uh, won't work. Anyway, uh, let's go back to an actual ABI break. It's a really wide uh, topic and it's uh, worth a read. There was actually uh, one uh, big ABI compatibility break. Uh, it uh, happened around times where C++11 was uh, introduced. And uh, from what I remember, it, were, it were some changes of standard string uh, not to allow a copy on write uh, anymore because, uh, yeah, it was uh, not the optimal implementation. And somebody just wanted uh, to optimize uh, it uh, but, and uh, changed the class uh, signature and uh, moved around some elements. But as a result, uh, many bad things happened, uh, many things stopped to work, and uh, GCC needed to support uh, dual ABI. There was a lot of uh, confusion uh, which uh, version of ABI should be linked at uh, which point. Uh, some uh, systems like uh, Red Hat are still actually using uh, the old standard string API, even though it's 2023 right now. There were needs to some extra compiler settings, uh, which sound absolutely cryptic if you are not aware of uh, this uh, break. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I found information that there were many more such uh, situations. Uh, I think uh, it happened around six times in uh, GCC already, but uh, each of such breaks uh, was maybe great from uh, the new user's perspective, but uh, it needed to be somehow backward compatible and it introduced uh, a lot of uh, headache both for compiler maintainers and the end users. Then imagine that uh, you, there were even seven such breaks and uh, you need uh, a particular mix of uh, seven new compiler flags uh, for your code uh, backward compatibility. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of uh, additional uh, work and uh, additional uh, confusion. That's why uh, ABI breaks uh, in a standard C++ library are were usually very frowned upon. Yeah, here let's have a really short example of uh, breaking ABI with some innocent change. So... Yeah, here we have a really dumb uh, example of uh, some very simple library which only contains, as you can see, one method doing uh, almost uh, nothing. It just uh, shows one string and that's all. There is also 
our main, which uses uh, foo as a shared library, which just uh, calls this uh, one method and that's all. As you can see, it's uh, void uh, foo, taking uh, no arguments, returning nothing. But let's assume that, okay, maybe first of all, let's uh, run it to show that it works. And uh, let's assume uh, main is our user's application and we are developers of foo. And uh, it's really easy to break it. Actually, let's do what I found out today in the morning. It's absolutely sufficient to make foo inline. Yep. Then let's recompile it. And we're broken. And it takes uh, this small amount uh, to make your ABI incompatible. If you add uh, some uh, new version of Foo, which is in line, then it's uh, fine. Keep that in mind. Anyway, here was a really short demonstration of uh, how fragile things can be. And let's go back to the original presentation. And uh, yeah. C++, uh, as you already guessed, doesn't have stable ABI between compilers. It has stable ABI only if everything is compiled by a single compiler. That's why there are Linux uh, distributions. And uh, it means that uh, everything was uh, compiled by a single compiler and uh, it's uh, possible to run it on a particular Linux distribution. It's been a very hot topic for C++ because uh, many things are waiting in a queue to be developed or improved, but right now it's uh, not possible due to ABI compatibility. Uh, I think the first request to add uh, any standardized uh, ABI in C++ uh, appeared around C++ 14 version by uh, Herb uh, Sutter. I guess uh, you know the guy. And uh, what else can be said? Uh, yeah, obviously C++ ABI compatibility is a much more complex topic than for C++. C on uh, pure C because uh, there are much more uh, mostly OOP specific things uh, that uh, needs to be handled. And uh, these are these things like uh, V tables, which are specified by the standard, but only on the high level and not on the ABI level. And uh, yeah, here are uh, things uh, which are uh, usually not allowed in uh, C++ standard libraries code. And uh, it also explains uh, why implementation of some things takes such a long time. Uh, as I said, you cannot uh, add uh, new things to an existing class. You cannot change uh, template uh, arguments and it's bad. You cannot uh, make a uh, function template uh, non-template. Same for uh, making templates variadic. That's bad. Uh, making things inline, uh, as you saw a moment ago, it's uh, sufficient to break the compatibility. You cannot add default arguments to functions. It's bad uh, because uh, it's really useful when introducing backward uh, compatibility. And also, you cannot add uh, virtual functions uh, to existing classes. So these are pretty big uh, limits. Uh, and sometimes uh, explaining why we cannot have nice things uh, quickly. And uh, yeah, here is the compatibility proposal, which I mentioned. Uh, and as it slows down uh, C++ language uh, development, this discussion is still ongoing. It was uh, firstly brought up then, but uh, I remember that uh, there were several more great requests and there were some votes uh, for C20 if it's okay to break the ABI compatibility at this point, meaning uh, that uh, we will not be backward compatible starting from the new standard with the previous ones. But now we are allowed uh, to fix many things. 
Mm, and uh, yeah, what was uh, done is uh, that uh, people started, uh, people, I mean, people and uh, vendors started uh, to make an, uh, agreements uh, which are outside the standard. Uh, and uh, there's a really great uh, ABI specification, which is not a part of the court standard. Uh, it was originally developed for Itanium compilers, but uh, it's uh, widely used on uh, many processors uh, now, which defines uh, some uh, low level uh, details of how compilers should uh, do things. Good thing is that GCC and Clang and some of our uh, mainstream compilers follow that specification. So there are many things, of course, not everything uh, similar in uh, GCC and uh, Clang. And uh, here it uh, writes that uh, code compiled with this GCC and uh, Clang can be linked uh, together and uh, interoperate. I don't know how uh, relevant it is. Uh, I saw also some uh, complaints that uh, containers behave uh, differently on these uh, two compilers uh, anyway. But uh, great that there are actually some standard, uh, standardization attempts, uh, even if they happen outside of the main uh, library, maybe it uh, will make uh, our platforms safe because, uh, well, if you compile your things with uh, GCC and uh, then uh, you buy some uh, closed source shared library, which was compiled in Clang, uh, you are safer then. You don't need to recompile all your, all your code base only to be compliant with this uh, one shared library. Same from the other angle, if you compile your stuff with uh, GCC, you may safely assume that your customers who use uh, Clang to compile the client of your application uh, may be fully interoperative with you. Okay, so back to some ending remarks. Uh, what to do, how to live with uh, this uh, piece of knowledge, especially if you develop some shared libraries. Uh, you can be Microsoft Visual C++ and uh, make a new version and then state that it may not be compatible with a previous version and uh, then uh, make users stuck with uh, using a very old uh, version because they are scared of uh, extra time they need to spend to upgrade. However, uh, I see. I saw an information today that uh, starting from 2015, uh, almost everything uh, is uh, pretty backward compatible. But before 2013, it wasn't the case. Of course, you can be like this, but uh, you need to be like Microsoft is. And uh, final message is that. Uh, in some cases, especially if you switch between the platforms or tool chains or anything uh, which uh, uses different architecture, it's great to be aware that uh, there is some ABI, it may change and uh, maybe you will need to make your code more abstract uh, or divide some parts of it uh, to specify its behavior basing on the architecture. Uh, never try to memorize ABI because uh, there is uh, no need to. And uh, yeah, in case uh, you do any assembly code uh, tricks, tool chain related tricks or compiler related tricks, uh, it's also great to remember that uh, maybe at some point you will need to change the platform or change the compiler or your compiler will upgrade and these uh, tricks will be no longer relevant. It doesn't, uh, I don't say you don't have to use them, but it's uh, great to remember it in a long term. It's always good to test your code with uh, more than one compiler, especially if uh, what is usually the case, uh, you compile a part of your code for unit tests with a different compiler than a cross compiler for your destination application. It's uh, safe to assume that uh, 
to the, with the binary and library or two libraries compiled with uh, different uh, compilers, especially these uh, less mainstream ones may have some uh, communication issues uh, if uh, you don't uh, recompile them every time. And the good thing is that uh, there are many ABI stability trackers uh, available for uh, many, uh, many widely used uh, open source libraries, which uh, check uh, ABI uh, similarity between versions that uh, make uh, help you troubleshooting uh, if uh, something goes uh, really wrong. The one I found out about and I find really cool is, well, just ABI laboratory and uh, I checked it for Entool, for example, and it provides uh, ABI similarity uh, between uh, versions so that uh, if you need to upgrade some uh, library to a slightly newer version because uh, one uh, part of your ecosystem requires that, you, it's a great uh, idea to check it for compatibility with your current version because, uh, again, some weird things may happen and maybe some recompilation is uh, needed. There's also a nice uh, yet old guide from uh, Mozilla. What to do when uh, your code uh, doesn't build everywhere, but you want to build it. It's great to make decisions based on capabilities and not uh, particular compilers or particular versions of things, uh, because uh, it will be the most uh, durable for uh, long-term uh, maintenance maintenance of your code. And also, yeah, to keep the API portable. Yeah, and that's how we reached the end of the presentation. I'm waiting for your questions and checking the chat. Hope there are not many things in there. <laughs>